Pratt. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist here in Boston and your moderator for this morning. If you have any questions or concerns about the webinar, please feel free to reach out directly to Bethany Blackwell. She's AED's Marketing and Communications Manager at AED Headquarters. You can email her at bblackwell at aedweb.org. You can also reach her by dialing 703-234-4120 in the U.S. and by adding a plus one outside the U.S. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. All participants are muted, with the exception of Dr. Mitchell and myself and Bethany, who's joining us today. The webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes and is being recorded. It will be posted on the AED website shortly thereafter for AED members to download at their convenience 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In just a few minutes, Dr. Mitchell will begin her presentation after which she'll answer questions from the audience. Please feel free to submit your questions to me during the presentation using the text box on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll read them to her when the question portion of the webinar begins. Dr. Mitchell, let's check your volume quickly. Please just say a few words, and if a couple of the participants can let me know if you can hear her clearly by sending a message in the text box I just mentioned, we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me. I heard you, Karen. Not seeing <laughs> Anybody else out there? Any. <laughs> I know there's some attendees, but I'm not seeing any. Um, let's see. Maybe they're not able to type in, but they can hear us. If someone can give a shout out just in that text box and let me know that our volume is good, then we'll go ahead and get started. Oh, I hear, I hear, yeah. Oh, did you see something? Yeah, they put it in, yes, I can see, they can hear. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I just don't see it, but I, I'm sure I'll see the questions when they come in. All right. So thank you everyone for letting us know that the volume level is good. So let's begin um, by introducing Dr. Mitchell. So for those of you who don't know her, she is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine. In addition, she's been a staff psychologist at the Women's Health Sciences Division of the National Center for PTSD at VA Boston Healthcare System since 2009. She completed her PhD in counseling psychology with a subspecialty in quantitative methodology at Virginia Commonwealth University in 2009. While in graduate school, she also completed a pre-doctoral fellowship on an NIMH T32 in psychiatric and statistical genetics at the Virginia Institute for Psychiatric and Behavioral Genetics. Dr. Mitchell completed her pre-doctoral internship in health psychology at the Cleveland VA Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Her research interests include eating disorders, obesity, behavior genetics, PTSD, and complementary and alternative medicine, particularly yoga. Methodologies used include twin modeling, network science, epigenetic mechanisms, hierarchical linear modeling, and structural equation modeling. She recently completed an NIMH K01 investigating gene environment interplay in the comorbidity of PTSD and disordered eating. As a licensed psychologist, a licensed clinical psychologist, Dr. Mitchell's clinical interests include eating disorders, PTSD, and health psychology, including obesity and metabolic disorders. So without further ado, Dr. Mitchell, the audience is yours. Thank you so much, Liz. And, um, and I wanted to especially thank Liz for agreeing to moderate today. She has a lot of expertise in this area and gave me some very helpful feedback on an earlier version of my slides. So I'm really grateful she could be here with us today. Uh, so today we'll talk about goals for the presentation, and I'll give an overview of PTSD criteria and prevalence, kind of assuming this audience um, is more familiar with eating disorders. I just wanted to make sure you um, have some resources on hand about PTSD. We'll talk about associations between trauma, PTSD, and eating disorders, um, potential mechanisms and case conceptualization of these associations, which will guide treatment planning. 
Then I'll give you some resources on PTSD assessment and treatment, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about how to address PTSD and eating disorder treatment. And then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So I want to say up front, there are no established integrated treatments for comorbid eating disorders and PTSD. Um, and I'm saying that for your sake and mine, because as I started to put this together, I felt like I really wanted to be able to, to give you everything you needed to go treat your patients with eating disorders and PTSD. But um, I realized that that's not possible. We don't have all the answers yet. They're probably out there somewhere, but we don't know them. And, um, and with these complex cases, um, there are a lot of decision points and no one-size-fits-all treatments. Anyway, um, so my goals for this presentation are to provide you with resources for learning more about PTSD treatment and things to consider in treating comorbid PTSD and eating disorders and ideas of where to start. Um, not that all of you will leave knowing exactly what to do, um, but hopefully you'll have some good tools to start with. Um, so briefly, DSM-5 criteria for PTSD, many of you may know that it's somewhat unique in that it requires exposure to a traumatic event. Um, and the DSM-5 committee came up with a list of the traumas that qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD, if symptoms are present. Um, and that's being exposed to death, threatened death, actual or threatened injury, actual or threatened sexual violence. Um, and this can be through direct exposure or witnessing, or in some cases, learning that a close friend or relative was exposed. Um, and in, in, in some cases, indirect exposures, exposure, such as first responders or medics. Um, that's a little bit of a moving target, deciding exactly what um, a trauma is, but that's what they, they have. And then the criteria are divided into four main symptom clusters. So um, cluster B, re-experiencing symptoms such as intrusive thoughts, nightmares, or flashbacks. Uh, criterion C, avoidance, such as avoiding trauma-related thoughts or feelings or reminders. Cluster D, negative alterations in mood or consciousness, um, such as inability to recall key features of the trauma, overly negative thoughts or assumptions, exaggerated blame, negative affect. And criterion E, arousal for irritability or aggression, risky behaviors, hypervigilance, heightened startle. It can also include difficulty concentrating and difficulty sleeping. PTSD is far more prevalent in women, um, and I've given you some rates from the National Comorbidity Surveys um, with a little over 11% of adult women and about 7% of uh, female adolescents, and um, then 4% of adult men and about 2% of male adolescents. Uh, DSM-5 PTSD, the prevalence looks pretty comparable, maybe slightly lower due, due to some changes in the criteria, um, but pretty close, and those are numbers from a nationally representative sample. Um, the one exception for anyone working with military or veteran populations, um, these population, in these populations, men um, tend to have comparable rates of PTSD as women. Um, we're not quite sure, but it might be due to the severity of the trauma experience. So many of you may know that uh, trauma, particularly childhood sexual abuse, is a nonspecific risk factor for eating disorders because it precedes the onset of many other disorders. And childhood forms of trauma, such as sexual, emotional, and physical abuse, have historically been the most often studied with respect to eating disorders. Uh, but women and men with eating disorders tend to have high rates of adulthood traumas as well um, and interpersonal traumas um, in general. So I've given you some findings from the National Comorbidity Survey, um, very high rates of rape, childhood physical abuse, which I've abbreviated as CPA, physical intimate partner violence, um, childhood domestic violence exposure, and then the majority of men and women with lifetime eating disorders had lifetime exposure to any interpersonal trauma, or IPT, there at the bottom of the table. Men and women with eating disorders also have high rates of lifetime PTSD diagnoses, so about a third of women with bulimia, and about a fourth of women and men with binge eating disorder, and then rates of PTSD in men with bulimia might be even higher. Uh, it's less often studied, but it looks like rates of PTSD are higher in the binge purge subtype of anorexia compared to the restricting subtype. Um, and it seems that PTSD sort of clusters with eating disorders characterized by binging and purging. There are a few different mechanisms that may account for these associations, which can inform um, case conceptualization and treatment planning. So interpersonal trauma may directly have a negative impact on one's body image. Um, studies have found that women with histories of sexual assault have more negative images of their physical selves. 
Abuse also may, may lead women to develop more critical views of themselves, which can lead to body image disturbance. Um, some women may attempt to increase their self-esteem via weight loss, um, you know, in a culture that values smaller physiques. Um, you know, notice most of these studies are on women. Uh, women may wish to be thinner in order to minimize secondary sex characteristics or perhaps heavier to appear uh, maybe less attractive and sort of armor or protect oneself against future perpetration. There's also a more indirect path um, in which trauma exposure can lead to a sort of general psychobiological dysregulation, which can increase the risk of developing various forms of psychopathology, certainly PTSD, as well as disordered eating, borderline personality disorder, substance use disorder, depression. Um, and it's often conceptualized that binge eating and purging may be used to sort of numb out or self-medicate and decrease emotional arousal, in which, in this way, eating disorder symptoms would serve as emotion regulation strategies um, in response to the PTSD symptoms and negative affect. Impulsivity is also associated with both PTSD and eating disorders and can be thought of as a behavioral aspect of emotion dysregulation. And one study found that using binge eating and purging to regulate negative affect and anxiety may be particularly characteristic of individuals high in impulsivity. So that might be one reason that PTSD um, clusters with the binging, purging eating disorders. So certainly case conceptualization is not one size fits all, um, but just to recap, interpersonal trauma may negatively impact body image, binge eating and purging and other compensatory behaviors may be used as a self-medication um, strategy to escape the negative self-awareness associated with PTSD. In this way, the eating behaviors are negatively reinforced because they help avoid the PTSD reminders. Um, and again, it's been less often studied, but as far as restricting behaviors, it's possible they serve as a means of control in response to trauma exposure that sort of by definition increases your feeling of lack of control over yourself and the world, and these random terrible things can happen. So um, restricting behaviors may serve as a, a way to regain some sense of control. In a recent survey of eating disorder clinicians, uh, they by and large felt that it was important to address trauma-related symptoms in eating patients, and that trauma-related symptoms were an obstacle to recovery, but the clinicians perceived substantial barriers to implementing evidence-based trauma-focused treatment with their patients with eating disorders, and those included um, being uncertain how to integrate treatment, um, which is not surprising because we don't um, have established treatments low familiarity with trauma-focused treatment, um, perceived institutional barriers to delivering what they thought would be long-term treatment, um, and concern that clients weren't ready. So we can address some of those today. Um, first, lack of assessment of PTSD might be a barrier for treatment. If, um, if you don't have a good handle on you know, what's the patient's trauma history and PTSD symptoms, um, you know, they may be interfering with um, improvement in eating symptoms without you really having a good, good sense of why that is. So I've given you some websites, and I think Bethany uploaded a handout with um, some of these slides with websites on them. Um, the National Center for PTSD website has a huge amount of resources on PTSD, um, including some assessments that you can download in training videos, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the PTSD checklist, or PCL for DSM-5, is a 20-item self-report survey that corresponds to the 20 DSM-5 criteria. There are monthly and weekly versions, so if you wanted to monitor your symptoms, your patient symptoms over time um, at either a monthly or weekly frequency, we'll often give the PCL weekly if we're doing trauma-focused treatment to monitor symptoms. So that's an easy one to administer. Patients can usually do it in a few minutes. Um, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, or CAPS, is the gold standard interview assessment. And the National Center website includes a training video, and you can also download the interview. And then the SCID, if you're familiar with that, uh, the PTSD module is um, the perfectly good assessment as well. And I also wanted to briefly go over the leading therapies for PTSD treatment and then talk more specifically about how um, they may be integrated into treatments for eating disorders, um, particularly cognitive processing therapy and also some prolonged exposure. So psychotherapy is a frontline treatment for PTSD and in particular trauma-focused therapies. 
Cognitive processing therapy, or CPT, focuses on challenging and modifying maladaptive beliefs about the trauma. Prolonged exposure, PE, um, is, involves imaginal and in vivo exposures to safe situations. And then eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR, also has a good amount of support. Um, it involves imaginal exposure to trauma while making saccadic eye movements. Um, this is a little more controversial because we don't know exactly what the eye movement aspect of it does. Um, it's unclear if that um, helps alleviate PTSD symptoms or whether it's more that the imaginal, the exposure aspect of it sort of driving change. Um, but it does seem fairly effective. I'm not going to talk about that one as much because um, I, I don't know as much about it and I don't know exactly how it, how it is effective. Um, so we'll, I'll spend more time on CPT and PE. Medication, particularly SSRIs, um, and also non-trauma-focused therapies have um, some support for symptom reduction as well. Um, so sometimes patients aren't um, quite ready or um, not interested in trauma-focused treatment. Present-centered therapy, which focuses on the aspects of day-to-day -day functioning that are impacted by the trauma, but, not, um, but you don't really focus on the trauma itself. And then um, interpersonal therapy that focuses on the impact of trauma on interpersonal functioning um, might be useful. And then there's a newer treatment that integrates dialectical behavior therapy and prolonged exposure that shows some promise and could be useful for um, patients with eating disorders as well. So I'll go over um, CPT and PE um, somewhat briefly. I pre I'm presenting an outline of the 12 sessions of cognitive processing therapy because I'm also going to talk about how that might be integrated with cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders. Um, so I'll just briefly go through the, um, the structure of the treatment and the main themes. So we begin with introducing um, and educating on cognitive theory, PTSD symptoms, and the role of emotions in trauma recovery. As with many cognitive treatments, it's very homework heavy. And the first homework assignment is for the patient to write an impact statement on why they think that the trauma happened and the consequences of the trauma in terms of beliefs about oneself and others in the world. And then from that impact statement, we begin to identify stuck points. What are the cognitions that are keeping the patient stuck um, and sort of not letting um, the trauma be you know, processed and the natural emotions Sort of flow from that and then and resolve. Um, so the patient reads the stuck point, reads the impact statement in the second session, and together with the therapist begins to identify stuck points that will become targets in treatment. Um, so one, something like, it was my fault because I was drinking. Um, and this is a very worksheet heavy treatment. So we would begin with ABC sheets that we use to identify connections between thoughts, feelings, and events. Um, so that stuck point might be the thought that you would focus on. And I'll show an example on the next slide. <clears throat> then we start using the ABC sheets to talk about connections between events, thoughts, and feelings, and then start to gently challenge thoughts about the traumatic event. Um, as we continue identifying stuck points about the event, um, use very empathic Socratic questioning um, to sort of unpack those thoughts and get the context around them. So an example of um, something that might go on an ABC sheet, uh, the activating event might be something like, I was raped. The belief or stuck point, I let it happen and didn't tell anyone. And the consequence or feeling might be guilt or shame. And then as the patient um, becomes ready, we start to talk about are those thoughts in column B realistic or helpful? And if not, what can I tell myself on such occasions in the future? And so that begins um, the process of, of challenging those thoughts and reframing them. So then we move into challenging questions, um, evidence for and against the problematic beliefs, um, such as is the belief a habit or based on facts? Are you thinking in all or none terms? Are the judgments based on feelings rather than facts? Um, and then we look at patterns of problematic thinking, and these are all worksheets, um, which I'll show you the sort of most comprehensive worksheet in, in a later slide. So the patterns of problematic thinking, um, oversimplifying, overgeneralizing, exaggerating or minimizing, and then use, again, very empathic challenging questions to challenge the thoughts about the trauma. And then the challenging beliefs worksheet kind of brings us all together where we identify the situation or event, the automatic thought, the emotions that are tied to that thought, and then challenge the thought, identify problematic patterns of thinking, and generate alternative thoughts, and then identify new emotions um, 
with that go with the alternative thought. So here's an example um, from, uh, I believe, a veteran. This is from the CPT manual. So the event was, I led my company into an ambush and many of my men were killed. And then the automatic thought is, I should have prevented it. It is my fault that people were killed. And he rated it um, 100%. He believes this 100%. The emotions that are tied to that thought are guilt, 100%, um, sort of how strongly he feels it, helpless and anxious, 75%. And then column D lists the challenging questions um, to examine that thought from column B. So evidence for the thought, people were killed. Evidence against, there was no way to know there was going to be an ambush. That's the nature of an ambush. To think I should have known it is coming is to ignore the fact that it was an ambush. Um, and then they kind of use the questions that um, seem most applicable. So if you go down to the all or none, <clears throat> he wrote, no one else would have led their company into an ambush. That's all or none thinking. No one else in the world would have done what he did. And then in column E, what are the problematic um, patterns? He's ignoring important parts of the situation. He wrote, I haven't been paying attention to the fact that it was an ambush. There's no way I could have known um, because that's what an ambush is. And then at the bottom of column E, is he using emotional reasoning? Um, he wrote, because I feel guilty, I am guilty. So an alternative thought in column F all the way to the right, there was no way to see it coming at the time. He rates it 85%. I did the best I could given the circumstances, 90%. It's not my fault that people were killed in the ambush, 75%. And then re-rating that old thought or stuck point in column B, he now believes that at only about 10%, um, and his emotions have come down, that guilt, 40%, helpless, 80%, and anxious, 40%. So we use these worksheets a lot to work on the stuck points that are identified throughout the course of treatment. And then the last several sessions of CPT um, use modules um, that have themes that are pretty salient to people with um, trauma exposure and PTSD. And I've added in, in blue font some ways that these themes um, are also apply to patients who have comorbid eating disorders. And that's from the Trim It All chapter um, that was recently published by some colleagues of mine on treating um, patients with comorbid eating disorders and PTSD. So in terms of safety, people who've been exposed to trauma have um, often a lot of safety concerns. And for eating disorder patients in particular, they may manipulate their size or weight to provide protection from future trauma. Perhaps the trauma occurred at a certain weight and then that weight becomes tied to the feeling of unsafe at that weight. And then trust certainly can be um, impacted by trauma exposure, and then eating disorder patients also may have trust, difficulty trusting providers about their eating and weight, um, in addition to the more in general interpersonal distrust from trauma exposure. And the power and control, um, which are impacted by trauma exposure for eating disorder patients, they, they may also have concerns about control over their food and weight. Um, and then we also address esteem and intimacy and the meaning of the event um, and wrap up. So the standard treatment is 12 sessions. Um, sometimes with patients who uh, need more time on any of these modules, we might go back to that if, um, if, if it seems there are things that haven't been fully resolved at the end of 12 sessions. And I'll talk later about the um, possibility of variable length CPT. I'm going to mention there's a CPT coach app that's available on the National Center website that's used in conjunction with treatment. Um, I'm going to get a sip of water really quick. And then I'll briefly talk about prolonged exposure. So PE is delivered um, in 8 to 15 weekly sessions that range in length from 60 to 90 minutes. And I think there have been some recent papers on sort of um, the frequency and duration and, um, you know, things to consider in making those decisions. The sessions focus on breathing retraining for relaxation and imaginal exposure by repeatedly describing the trauma and then in vivo exposure to safe situations. Practice assignments include exposure-based activities and um, also listening to the therapy session recordings where the patients describe their trauma. And there's a PE Coach mobile app also on the National Center website that's used in conjunction with therapy. 
So there have been a couple of recent studies on uh, dialectical behavior therapy, PE. Um, I think it's uh, kind of promising for patients who have a more um, complex presentation, and this could be useful for patients with eating disorders and PTSD as well, although it hasn't been studied yet. But the rationale is that borderline personality disorder, PTSD, and suicidal and non-suicidal self-injury often co-occur. And it's unclear how well existing PTSD treatments address these co-occurring problems. Also, comorbid conditions um, may be best treated with an integrated approach that addresses the relationships among the, co the conditions. And we'll talk more later about sequential versus concurrent treatments. Um, but the, uh, that seems to go well with uh, DBT and PE. So this involves your standard outpatient DBT with a DBT PE protocol, protocol integrated into the DBT. And findings from an open trial were pretty promising, so there was no increased self-injury, and patients had large improvements in PTSD symptoms, as well as dissociation, shame, depression, and anxiety. So DBT, the standard treatment, um, consists of weekly one-hour outpatient sessions, two and a half hours a week of group skills training, phone consultation is needed, and then um, weekly therapist consultation meetings. And the treatment targets in hierarchical order are life-threatening behaviors, therapy interfering behaviors, and then quality of life interfering behaviors. DBTPE is implemented concurrently with standard DBT. So they recommend either one combined therapy session um, with 60 minutes of DBTPE and 30 minutes of standard DBT, or perhaps two individual sessions per week. Um, and I think this is just based at this point on um, patient and clinician preference. So the DBTPE involves in vivo exposure and imaginal exposure, followed by processing the exposure. And then the DBT strategies that are integrated with PE include monitoring post-exposure urges to commit suicide or self-injure, targeting problems such as dissociation and increased suicidal ideation, um, and then therapists use strategies such as didactics, irreverence, self-disclosure, and validation um, that are part of standard DBT. The developers recommend, it, recommend stopping therapy, um, hopefully temporarily, if intentional self-injury occurs. And again, this has showed um, findings look promising so far for patients with comorbid um, PTSD and BPD. So uh, this is potentially promising for patients with eating disorders and PTSD as well. Um, because eating disorders are also often comorbid with borderline personality disorder and parasuicidal behavior. The biosocial model of borderline personality disorder applies to the etiology of eating disorders in that symptoms are an ongoing effort to modulate overwhelming emotions that result from an ongoing transaction between logic vulnerability and exposure to an invalidating environment. So in this conceptualization, eating disorder behaviors serve as efforts to modulate emotions. And there's evidence that DBT may be beneficial to patients who do not sufficiently respond to cognitive behavioral therapy um, for various reasons. And I think the most evidence so far is for DBT is treatment for binging disorder um, and maybe not quite as much for anorexia and bulimia. Um, but it's uh, one, one option for patients with a lot of comorbidity and complexity. So what do I do as an eating disorder clinician who sees patients who also have PTSD? I think a lot of it will depend on the severity and complexity of the patient. Um, and uh, the case conceptualization or formulation can really guide the treatment approach. Um, so some things to think about are the eating disorder symptoms secondary to the trauma and PTSD. Um, are they, is it mostly self-medicating? Might they remit a little if the PTSD were treated first, for example? Um, did it maybe start out that way, but then the eating symptoms took on a life of their own? Or did the eating symptoms actually precede the trauma? Um, and what are the functional links between the PTSD and eating disorder symptoms? And then do we treat them sequentially or concurrently? There's the pros and cons to both. So with sequential treatment, um, you might need to treat one condition first for safety reasons. So you know, with eating disorders, we talk a lot about um, making sure they're medically stable um, and adequately nourished to, um, to be able to work on more complex, uh, like cognitive and emotional treatments. Treating one condition may reduce barriers to effectiveness for the other treatment. So if the eating disorder is um, really serving to help avoid the PTSD, then perhaps treating it first um, 
in addition to being to sort of medical stabilization, might help them avoid trauma-focused treatment less. Um, but it's also possible that treating one disorder can worsen the other disorder. Um, and in the Trim it All chapter, they call this like a ther therapy whack-a-mole, where you maybe get the eating disorder symptoms down in order to start trauma-focused treatment, but then the eating disorder symptoms ramp back up um, as a coping strategy um, with tra when the trauma-focused treatment starts, and you might get stuck in that cycle. So concurrent treatment can minimize that self-perpetuating cycle, um, but again, there aren't um, established integrated treatments for PTSD and eating disorders, um, and there aren't a lot for other combinations of disorders as well. So, um, so I think there are a lot of benefits to concurrent, but we don't always have a good roadmap of how to do that. Patients also may have a preference, and that's certainly very important. Um, they may come in um, with a desire to treat one disorder versus the other. Um, in which case you could start with the disorder that they prefer to treat first and then reassess at the end of the first treatment. Because um, often treating one disorder will help symptoms of another disorder remit and then you can reassess and determine um, how much and what further treatment is needed. One rationale for treating PTSD first is that the symptoms may remit more quickly than the eating disorder symptoms. Um, 12 sessions of CPT is pretty effective for a lot of people, so that is, you know, seems a little bit quicker uh, than um, some eating disorder symptom remission. And if you wanted to do that, I would recommend you monitor the eating disorder during PTSD treatment. Um, and if it, if it does get significantly worse, you may need to stop PTSD treatment and address the eating disorder. And one thing about trauma-focused treatments is that um, patients tend to feel a little worse before they feel better. And we always try to um, to tell them that and warn them that that's totally normal. Um, they're going to be you know, dealing with things that they would rather be avoiding. And so their symptoms may get a little bit worse before they get better, but usually when they get better, it's pretty quickly after that. And I've diagrammed a couple of um, alternative case formulations, um, certainly not one size fits all, but just to give a ex couple of examples. Um, this first one's uh, perhaps a simpler, quote unquote, um, formulation where the eating symptoms are pretty secondary to the PTSD and might remit some by focusing on the PTSD first. So the patient was exposed to trauma and developed PTSD. Um, both of those impacted um, the patient starting to binge eat as sort of a self-medicating um, function. And um, maybe the patient also developed obesity, which um, might be addressed in treatment as well. But this is one where um, it might make sense to start with PTSD treatment and monitor the eating symptoms. In contrast, a more um, sort of a complex formulation where the patient had a history of childhood abuse and adulthood sexual assault, both of which can contribute to body image disturbance. Um, the patient developed PTSD. Uh, because of the body image disturbance, the patient began a cycle of um, restricting and binge eating and purging, and then the disordered eating symptoms were also started to serve the function of um, coping with PTSD symptoms. And so this is a more um, sort of inter, interwoven formulation where perhaps concurrent treatment um, might, might be more useful to treat both at once um, because of the various functional links between the symptoms. Um, and you may notice I didn't include a lot of other comorbid symptoms um, in these two um, case formulations, which certainly will be a consideration. You know, a lot of patients who have one disorder have more than one, and if they have two, they may have three. Um, you know, this, this is definitely not, not simple or straightforward. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Tim Burton published some guidelines on when to begin trauma-focused treatment for patients with comorbid eating and PTSD. And I think these are quite useful. So for eating disorder patients, begin PTSD treatment when the patient indicates readiness. Um, that's certainly very important. Uh, when the patient's adequately nourished and can process information. When the eating symptoms are relatively under control. And then when the patient demonstrates an adequate level of distress tolerance. And I think that's very subjective. Um, and even uh, working in a clinic where, um, so I work in a clinic in the VA for women veterans where all of the veterans have a history of trauma. Um, they may or may not come in specifically for PTSD treatment, but um, this is a, a clinic where we see a lot of PTSD cases and spend a lot of time discussing um, how, you, how you know when your patient's ready for trauma-focused treatment. And, um, and it's, you know, I wish I could give you a really easy guideline, but there is not one. 
um, so that, you know, this is something you and your patient talk about and perhaps do some skills building um, if necessary. So one thing we will use um, techniques from DBT with the uh, like emotion regulation and interpersonal functioning and distress tolerance. Um, you might do some skills building on, on those things until you and your patient um, feel that he or she is ready for trauma-focused treatment. It's just one idea to try. And because PTSD and eating disorders share many common biological and psychological features, it's possible that treatment for one disorder would result in improvement of symptoms for the other disorder, as I mentioned, and cognitive treatments are indicated for both disorders. So it's possible that challenging um, the problematic beliefs, um, you can sort of target the shared vulnerability. Um, but again, there's no real guidance on which to do first. It'll depend on all of these other things we've been talking about. Um, I'm going to talk more about whether you, um, how you could treat eating disorders within the context of CPT, cognitive processing therapy, and then how you could use CPT in the context of cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders. Um, because I think the two treatments have a lot of parallels and are kind of a natural fit for each other. Um, so again, for a case where the eating disorder feels more sort of secondary to the PTSD and trauma, um, you might, for example, with, um, with the stuck point, that you and your patient target in treatment, um, maybe focus some of those specifically on the impact of the trauma on body image and disordered eating behaviors. And monitor eating symptoms throughout the course of treatment using food records. Um, and then perhaps in introduce some behavior modifications. So um, if when you're working on the patient's avoidance, for example, um, if you and the patient kind of realizing that they're engaging in binge eating when they're trying to avoid thinking about their trauma, and maybe that's a barrier to them completing their homework um, and a barrier to them um, starting to get better from their PTSD symptoms, it would be worthwhile to start talking about healthier ways of coping and do some problem solving. Um, we kind of do this for a variety of things. If, um, if if patients are doing things, maybe um, drinking or using substances or any other sort of risky behaviors um, outside of session, we would, we would address it in that way. And I think that addressing the disordered eating could make a lot of sense in that context as well. Um, I will say we did a paper, it was a secondary analysis of data from a cognitive processing therapy trial where um, the presenting concern was PTSD, and none of the therapists would have talked specifically about disordered eating. Um, and they were fairly adherent to the protocol. So um, just sort of standard CPT without additional attention to disordered eating. Um, they had administered the eating disorder inventory. So we looked at symptoms um, common to PTSD and eating disorders, such as impulse regulation, interceptive awareness, interpersonal distress and ineffectiveness. We found that those symptoms improved, but there weren't any significant changes in um, specific bulimia symptoms or drive for thinness. Um, so it seemed like standard CPT um, could help um, get some symptom reduction, but not um, with the eating disorder specific behaviors and cognitions, um, suggesting that additional treatment might be needed for those specific behaviors. <clears throat> And so far, one study has looked at an integrated um, C CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, for eating disorder and PTSD patients. Um, this is a very uh, specific sort of therapy that was implemented following inpatient or intensive outpatient treatment for the eating disorder. And they did a 16-session integrated treatment um, that aimed to maintain the eating disorder gains while treating PTSD. So they used cognitive processing therapy and elements of cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced. CBTE for eating disorders. In a non-controlled trial, most of the patients experienced excellent cognitive and behavioral eating disorder improvement, improvement and PTSD improvement. Um, and most of the rest of them experienced pretty good improvements but still had some eating disorder cognitions. And I think one or two patients um, either dropped out or relapsed. Um, so this is one potential option. Um, but again, the evidence so far is for patients who've already had a pretty intensive course of eating disorder treatment. So I'll talk more about um, kind of behavioral therapy enhanced for eating disorders and how that might be um, either tweaked to address PTSD symptoms or potentially modified by adding some um, cognitive processing therapy to it. So I assume that most people are somewhat familiar with this treatment, but I, um, I'll do an overview to sort of get us all on the same page. 
So psychotherapy, frontline treatment for eating disorders, and cognitive behavioral therapy is the strongest evidence for bulimia. Um, for a long time, there wasn't a lot of evidence for binge eating disorder. Um, seemed like uh, treatments for bulimia would work. And then for anorexia, um, for adolescents, it was family-based therapy, but there wasn't really a lot of good evidence um, for therapies in adults with anorexia. And also, um, only about 50% of cases remitted following treatment. So Fairburn and colleagues um, developed cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced. It's meant to be transdiagnostic and to apply to all eating disorders um, because also then there was eating disorder not otherwise specified um, that didn't, that nobody really knew exactly what to do with. And, um, and so CBTE was meant for all of the eating disorders um, and meant to be more of a toolkit approach. Um, so you can kind of choose um, sort of go in different directions depending on the patient's symptoms. Um, and it treats the pathology and not a specific diagnosis. So the focus is on the key features that um, apply across disorders, over-evaluation of weight and shape, extreme dietary restraint and weight control behaviors, binge eating and purging, and significantly low weight. Um, there's a 20 and a 40 session version. Um, so the 40 session version is used for patients with severe underweight. And then there are focused, um, which is the default, and broad forms of CBTE. So I'll do a, a brief overview of the 20 session version. So CBTE begins with assessment of current eating pathology and case formulation, which is a very important part of CBTE. Um, patients and therapists do this together. Uh, the therapist provides treatment rationale and introduces the importance of real-time self-monitoring of eating behaviors and then engages the patient in, um, in the treatment and change. And then begins with in-session weighing, reviewing self-monitoring records that are, that are a big part of homework. Um, and patient therapist again review the case formulation. Stage one continues with the in-session weighing and reviewing monitoring and going over homework, which is an important part of the therapy. Um, educating by eating problems and establishing regular eating is a big, important first part. And then um, addressing compensatory behaviors and addressing the function of the binge eating and purging or other behaviors. Stage two is a transition stage where patient and therapists review progress, identify barriers to change, um, review the formulation again, and decide here whether to continue with the focused form or use CBTE broad. And that's when there's an external factor that's um, driving a lot of the eating. So core perfectionism, low self-esteem, or interpersonal problems that maintain the eating disorder. And there are modules for each of those. Stage three addresses the key maintaining mechanisms, partly depending on case formulation. Um, Overvaluation of weight and shape, overvaluation of control over eating, dietary restraint, dietary restriction, underweight, and event or mood triggered changes in eating. And if the broad form of CBTE is needed, um, you would add a module here for perfectionism, self esteem, or interpersonal functioning while continuing to address the core eating disorder factors. Um, and then stage four um, uh, maintenance and concerns about ending treatment and wrap up. With the 40 session version, um, it's all of this plus addressing motivation to change and under eating and being underweight and increasing weight. And so in the next couple of slides, I, um, I put in blue font some places that you might start addressing PTSD treatment in the context of CBTE. Um, so first, the default focused version. Um, with the case formulation, I think that's a great place to talk about um, the trauma and PTSD and how it fits in with the eating pathology and um, those functional links between the symptoms. And that can be is done throughout treatment. Um, in stage one, addressing the function of binge eating and purging, that is another um, really great place to start talking about um, how those symptoms might go with the the PTSD symptoms, and are they used to avoid or self-medicate, um, or, or possibly a restriction, is restriction used to help get a sense of control? In the transition stage, addressing barriers to change, um, perhaps the trauma and PTSD are presenting barriers to change, um, and again, reviewing the formulation. And then in stage three, um, where identifying event or mood triggered changes in eating is part of um, standard CBTE, this could be a specific place to address the trauma and PTSD symptoms as well. And then uh, the wrap-up stage. 
in the context of CBT eBroad, so the um, first several sessions would be the same. And then in stage three, uh, you continue addressing the key eating disorder mechanisms. And, um, and it's possible that the interpersonal module might be useful um, if there are interpersonal problems driving the eating disorder and if those problems are significantly impacted um, by the trauma and PTSD, that could be a place to use the interpersonal module that's part of CBTE broad um, while addressing the other eating disorder mechanisms. Um, Fairburn and all recommend, if possible, lengthening the sessions um, if you're doing the broad form in stage three. Um, so for example, the interpersonal module is an interpersonal therapy that you would do ideally in a longer session where you'd have CBTE plus the interpersonal therapy. Um, and again, I think this could be a place to potentially address um, PTSD symptoms if it fits with um, interpersonal therapy for your patient. Um, also along the lines of longer sessions, I think it could be possible to implement cognitive processing therapy in this stage. Um, I haven't found anything published on this, but I think it's, I think the two treatments fit very well together um, and have a lot of parallels. If you're able to do longer sessions and maybe add in a few more sessions in this stage um, where your sessions are divided between doing the CPT protocol and then the CBTE to address um, the eating disorder, the other eating disorder maintaining mechanisms. Um, I think this could fit very well here and would be a way to integrate treatment. So again, case formulation should really guide treatment. Um, I've referenced on a different slide the Becker and Zafert book on um, cognitive behavioral treatment for PTSD um, being driven by case formulation. I think that that's also a really helpful way to think about it. Um, and they um, present an eating disorder case in there as well. Um, so case formulation really should be the guide. Um, I recommend closely monitoring eating symptoms, particularly in focusing on trauma. And of course, that's a big part of CBTE. Um, I think Brewerton's guidelines for determining when to start trauma-focused treatment are really helpful. Um, and I think there's potential to implement CPT in stage three of CBTE, although um, to my knowledge this hasn't been researched. Um, but some colleagues and I are um, working on a paper addressing this and um, laying out potential options for doing that. Um, and then also treating eating symptoms within CPT, as I mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, so I think there's a lot of promise there. Now, I mentioned a couple of things that might be useful um, down the road. So there are forms of variable length CPT. So Golovsky and colleagues um, looked into whether early complete, so they discovered that early completers uh, were some, sometimes people drop out because they feel worse, but they discovered that a lot of people were dropping out because they felt better. Um, so instead of the standard 12 sessions, the early completers needed on average about seven and a half sessions. Um, and the majority of their sample achieved their in-state criteria before the 12th session. Um, some people needed longer. I think they went, some people needed up to 18 sessions, um, as I mentioned. And in practice, sometimes we do give extra sessions with um, the modules at the end of CPT. Um, so that's one interesting thing as far as integrating treatments. If there's, um, you know, there might be a brief form of CPT that comes down the pike that might be useful for integrating with eating disorder treatment. Um, and Golovsky and Nixon are working on a case formulation driven approach to CPT that could be useful. Um, I think um, in talking with Tara Golovsky, it's, I feel like there are a lot of parallels between um, the case formulation in CPT and CBTE. And there are also researchers that do exploring modular CPT. So that might be helpful as well as far as um, toolkit approaches and how you might choose modules that fit with eating disorder treatment depending on your patients patient's presentation. So to summarize, um, I think there's some potential treatment options that show promise. For eating disorder patients with less severe PTSD, it might be possible to address trauma and PTSD um, by making relatively minor tweaks to focus CBTE, um, certainly using the case formulation, um, and um, in, particularly in the context of identifying mood and event triggers of eating disorder symptoms. Um, I think it's also possible to address the impact of trauma and PTSD functioning on inter of trauma and PTSD on interpersonal functioning using the broad form of CBTE if that fits um, for your patient. For eating disorder patients with more severe PTSD, um, there is the integrated CBT for eating disorders and PTSD. Um, again, that was for patients who had had treatment for the eating disorder already. 
I think it is certainly possible to implement CPT within stage three of CBTE, um, particularly if you have the flexibility of offering longer or more sessions. And then eating disorder patients with PTSD who are good candidates for DBT due to their complexity, comorbid borderline personality disorder, haven't responded to CBT, um, DBT-PE might be very useful. And so a couple of things, I've said this a lot, but um, these are very complex disorders. There's no one size fits all. Um, if you're feeling a little bit at a loss of what to do with um, patients who have comorbid eating disorders and PTSD, you're not alone. I think it's, um, you know, this is really complicated stuff and we don't know all the answers at this point. Also, treatment options for anorexia nervosa are less clear. Um, it seems like CBTE shows some promise for our anorexia, um, but it's I think things are still a little preliminary. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done there as well. Um, the cognitive behavioral therapies are frontline treatments for eating disorders and PTSD, and DBTPE shows some promise as well. So again, concurrent treatments are probably most recommended, um, but some sequencing might be necessary, and there are a lot of reasons to consider one or the other, um, or even you know. If you did CPT within CBTE, sort of it has a little bit of sequencing built in there um, in that stages one and two focusing on, um, focus more on the eating and then introduce the trauma-focused therapy. So it's, um, there are a lot of different ways to go there. And certainly we need established integrated treatments. I'll leave you with some resources on PTSD, um, and you have that in the handout that Bethany uploaded. Um, so again, the National Center for PTSD has a ton of resources um, um, for the public and professionals, assessment tools, an overview of treatment, um, considerations for special populations. A lot of the training videos offer free CEUs, and there are links to mobile apps. So I mentioned CPT Coach and PE Coach, and there's also a more um, sort of general PTSD coach. The Medical University of South Carolina website has um, trainings for CPT and also trauma-focused CBT. And then the VA DOD clinical practice guidelines um, for PTSD might be useful for your patients. It um, does have a little bit more of a, a military um, and veteran focus, of course, but um, are still useful for presenting sort of the state of the art on clinical treatment of PTSD. And then there are also um, websites for CPT and PE. So I'll open it up for questions now, and I'm giving you my email address. Um, hopefully we'll get to all your questions, but if we don't or if things um, come up later, certainly feel free to email me. So I'll turn it over to Liz. Great. Thank you so much, Karen, um, Dr. Mitchell, for that truly informative presentation. I think that... Um, what we'll do is we'll start the question and answer portion of the webinar, and we're going to start by answering this question, which was posed by Krista. So her question is, what are your thoughts on somatic treatments for trauma based on neurological processing? So that's an area um, I'm not as familiar with. I think um, you know, from what I know about it, there's some interesting things out there, but um, you know, I, I don't feel fully qualified to give like a good evaluation of of those treatments. Um, I mean, as of right now, they're not sort of frontline. Um, probably they just need more research. Makes sense. Yeah. So it's kind of some of these are are new approaches folks are re recommending, but they don't have a lot of evidence as of yet. Right. No, it's certainly an area in thinking about, um, you know, eating disorders being, you know, a very physical um, disorder as well. But I think there's a lot we don't know at this stage. Makes sense. And I don't know if this is the same Krista. Um, it could be. She writes, do you use specific tools to measure motivation for change? Um, not really specific tools, but I definitely do draw from motivational interviewing. Um, so one question I'll ask a lot is on a scale from 1 to 10, how ready are you to make, you know, to make this change or engage in this treatment? Um, on a scale from 1 to 10, how, how certain are you that you can you know, go home and do this homework that we discussed? 
um, that kind of thing. Um, I like use, doing that a lot. I think that's really useful because um, ideally your, your patient gives you a number that you kind of, you know, could guess from, you know, having talked mm -hmm. with them throughout the session. Right. Um, but then if they give you a number that surprises you, that can be really useful too. Um, or if they say they're at a, at a four, you know, what, okay, what would it take to get you to a six or an eight? Um, and if they're, they're already at an eight, okay, well, what, what may, what makes you, what puts you at an eight? Why, you know, what, what got you all the way to an eight? Um, I think those um, kind of questions can be really useful, and even though the scale is subjective, kind of gives you a number. Yeah. So just gauging it kind of along the continuum and seeing, you know, where they where they land depending on what the task is, and also during treatment at different points. Right. Um, this this next one's from Kel, and she writes. So it's a question regarding it says when talking about DBT PE. One of the points um, was stopping therapy temporarily if self-injurious behavior occurs. Or I'm not sure, it says SI, so I guess it could also be suicidal ideation. But I think they mean self-injurious. Is this not experienced as a punishment by the patient, and thus could it negatively impact the therapy relationship? Um, I don't know if you have anything to say just in terms of with, those, with that complex patient group within GBTPE, um, you know, kind of how to treat those therapy interfering behaviors um, depending on, you know, kind of what stage they're at. Um, I'm not sure it's specific to treating the eating. So I'm not sure what you might want to say about that, Karen. Right. I think, and I think it's a fine line. You know, you certainly wouldn't want your patient to feel punished and, and also wouldn't want it to, you wouldn't want to, um, if it becomes a sort of way to avoid, you don't want to collude with that. You don't, you know, you want to help with your patient sort of stay on track and not, um, like, if that behavior becomes part of avoidance, you don't want to, like, help them continue to avoid by saying, oh, you're not ready to do this treatment. Um, and I think, I think it's a really fine line, and you do want to be careful about the message that you give to your patients. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important conversation to have with them. Like, I think we need to just temp temporarily pause this um, treatment while we make sure that you're safe and then get right mm -hmm. back on track. And, um, and safety planning would probably continue to be an overt part of treatment. Um, right. So I think just being very, very open and um, transparent with your patient about what you're doing and why and uh, making sure they're on the same page as you and um, very collaborative and warm right. discussions about that would be important. That sounds right. Yeah. And this next one's from Maria, and she writes, when PTSD is disruptive to the process um, of DBT for eating disorders, and it's difficult to get the individual to an ideal state for undergoing trauma therapy, what would be the recommendation? So that might be a good time to really focus on the skills building. Um, you know, without knowing exact, exactly what the disruption is, but as far as getting them ready for trauma-focused treatment, um, I would think focusing on the, the, skill, the skills building part that is, um, that is part of DBT, as far as really focusing on emotion regulation and distress tolerance, um, and perhaps interpersonal effectiveness, depending on the role of that as well. Um, and, and that can really help, can help them get ready and like help them feel that they have the skills to then tackle trauma-focused treatment. Um, right. I think could be very so A little bit like you were talking about within your clinic, the way you, you know, kind of give them tools and skills um, up front when they're not feeling ready, but to prepare, you know, down the road to engage in the trauma therapy. Right. Possibly. Um, this next one is from Maria, and she writes, when people are in limbic system mode, are there recommendations as to how to engage clients in cognitive processing? Um, so I, I guess I'm assuming that's sort of more, um, that, you know, they're not engaging their frontal cortex. They're kind of like... I think so. Resp just yeah. responding to the fear? Okay. Yeah. 
Hmm. I'm sorry, could you repeat the end of it again? So when they're in that mode, like how to get them oh, to engage? Yeah, so how do you get them to engage in cognitive processing if they're in limbic system mode? Um, I mean, if they if they just can't or won't do it, that would be um, perhaps an indication that more prolonged exposure in um, in just ex exposing them um, to imaginal um, mm -hmm. remembering the trauma in safe situations. I mean, it's, you know, none of these treatments are going to work for everybody, um, and, they, right. and often will you know make the decision over and with the patient if they are um, more up for PE or CPT. So perhaps if, um, if this patient just can't or won't do cognitive treatment, um, use more exposure-based treatments. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think they're referring specifically to the cognitive processing piece. So trying something else, more of the exposure-based might be the way to go. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. this one is from, um, Jillian, and it says, I work in a residential eating disorder setting, and we see clients whose PTSD symptoms increase and become seemingly unmanageable when we interrupt the ED behaviors. Do you have thoughts on treatment routes for these clients who have a severe eating disorder causing medical instability, but also PTSD that seems to significantly limit the work the clients are able to do within the residential setting? I think so this might get, those are tricky it, cases. Medical stabilization. Right. So I think getting them, you know, perhaps as stable as possible, which I think is somewhat of a moving target. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know, I haven't been able to find any super clear guidelines on like, you know, this, this is when you could, um, you know, this is when they're stable enough to do X, Y, or Z, but getting, them stable enough and trying, I think a concurrent treatment um, would make sense if it um, starts to feel like that whack-a-mole situation where um, you, know, you reduce the eating symptoms and then the PTSD ramps up because they don't have their avoidance strategies um, that they've used for a long time probably. And then so you get the mm -hmm. eating disorder, the PTSD down, the eating comes back up. Um, I think treating them concurrently as much as possible, which, um, you know, might be advantageous in a residential setting, um, I, I think would be beneficial for those patients um, with, you know, really close monitoring and safety planning and, and things like that. Right. And, um, and I actually have a question as well. It looks like we have made it through the majority of the others. I was just curious with that whack-a-mole situation that you were describing. I think that's very, you know, apropos to what tends to happen. Um, are there certain, I mean, depending on which is being treated at the time, are there certain relapse patterns or, um, you know, kind of directional or functional relationships you've seen either clinically or in your read of the research about kind of what what tends to be um, triggering of maybe a lapse or a relapse depending on, you know, which one is currently not popping up in the whack-a-mole, so things that clinicians might look out for? Um, I think I mean, one thing might be that um, the, the time in trauma-focused treatment when the patients start to feel worse before they feel better, I think that's a really mm -hmm. tricky time in general um, and would be like, I think that would, you'd want to be very transparent about with your patient about um, it's that's totally normal first of all um, and second right. of all you know I could I could see that you're I could envision your eating symptoms kind of uh, raising their heads as we as you if you feel a little bit worse um, when we start doing trauma focused treatment and do a lot of planning around that and maybe strategizing about um, what they could do instead and um, a lot like kind of like with safety planning. Um, if you feel the urge to um, to use vomiting or binging or um, excessive exercise, what can you do instead? Um, that that seems like the riskiest period. Right. Yeah, I like, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to like preemptively or in a planning way kind of anticipate that that might happen during that phase. 
um, mm -hmm. and to not and to not maybe view it as you know the, either the full disorder returning or you know a full relapse necessarily, but there may be lapses or um, shifts to those behaviors during the, the trauma focused treatment, for instance. Right. Um, and given how prevalent this seems clinically, I mean, I know from, and you know as well from working, you know, in PTSD clinics and working, you know, on the eating disorder clinic side, it's, it's often talked about clinically. And then I think you've given this great presentation of sort of what we know research-wise. What do you, you know, what are some of the next studies? I mean, you mentioned one that, you know, a paper you, you're working on, and what would be like the next step in terms of trying to figure out a good model of either concurrent treatment or integrated treatment? I mean, are there, do you feel like it's at the point where a clinical trial would be warranted, or what are you thinking is the next step for this particular um, subfield? I certainly think um, at least a pilot study and then a clinical trial in the not too distant future. Um, I think there are a lot of potential things to try. Um, and as I mentioned I'm like really interested in the idea of integrating CPT and CBTE. Um, so I, I think that that, I think we're at the point where we really need that. I think, I, I feel like I hear from clinicians a lot um, with these questions. And I know in, in the VA, which is a little bit unique and then there's not a lot of eating disorder treatment, you know, clinicians are, um, are like clamoring for anything that we can provide um, to help them with their patients. And um, I, I think we're getting to the point where we really need that next step. Um, Great. That makes a lot of sense. And um, another question has just come in, which is referring to the process this is a question from Christine. It says, which grounding, sorry, which grounding techniques do you use with clients who have these comorbid conditions? Um, I'm assuming sort of grounding like in the presence of dissociation? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that as well. I think probably within maybe when you are focused on the trauma-focused work with these patients, um, just you know, which grounding techniques are helpful um, either when they're experiencing dissociation or just in general for, I'm not even sure if maybe they, you know, they mean it broadly or very specifically. Okay, I guess, well, um, was it Christine or Christina? Feel free to write back if this doesn't answer it. Um, things that I've used uh, with dealing with dissociation, um, you know, kind of simple things as far as getting the patient to kind of sit and notice the sensation of, you know, her arms on the armrest of the chair and her feet on the floor and perhaps um, touching her, you know, her ring or her earrings or necklace or um, sort of like physical, um, simple ways to sort of reconnect with her, her body in the room and, um, and that kind of thing that usually if you can sort of catch it when it starts, um, I, I've, I feel like I've, usually have success starting there and sort of heading off the dissociation before it gets worse. Um, Liz, if you have other thoughts, they're certainly welcome. Sure. Yeah, and I just saw that she wrote in, so she says, yes, for dissociation or when triggered with symptoms. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think I, I totally agree. I think the grounding techniques, some of which are are outlined nicely in, like, the seeking safety um, treatment protocol and just other trauma-focused therapy protocols. So going to those first, like you say, connecting with kind of um, her, like presence, you know, presence-centered um, experience in the room and just trying to um, connect with, you know, sort of objective um, experiences. All right, and I think, I mean, I just had one more, Karen, if you'll <laughs> oh, you, sure. um, can answer one that I was thinking about. I know that you have an interest in complementary therapies, and I was thinking about this, um, just the notion of, I guess, m more along the lines of like mindfulness or yoga or other, um, you know, in, kind of in the category of like meditative practices. What from your experience with 
I would guess you would, you know, draw from what you know of, of yoga being a complementary medicine within PTSD. Is that something that, um, you know, you think would be especially helpful for these comorbid patients, or is there anything about um, that type of intervention that you know, indicated for eating disorder patients or, you know, not especially? I think there's some evidence for yoga, um, for PTSD and eating, probably more adjunctive um, and not so much frontline, at least at this point. Um, but I think right. that they, that they're, I think it could be very helpful to patients with either or both disorders um, for somewhat parallel reasons. Um, I think so. I did a little study on yoga for PTSD, and um, and I think part you know, partly when you think about you know trauma and PTSD and anxiety, I think the yoga sort of has a natural fit as far as the um, the relaxation and modulation. Um, but then also for um, people who've experienced you know interpersonal traumas, um, I mean I, I tend to think of this along the lines of um, sexual traumas, but other interpersonal or physical traumas. Um, and then also people with eating disorders sort of being able to kind of reconnect with their bodies and sort of get, um, you know, comfortable with their, their bodies and their beings again. Um, and their, their guidelines for trauma focused yoga that really, um, have a lot, it, like with, um, keeping in mind that, um, patients who've had these types of traumas might, might take, might be quite a process getting them comfortable with their bodies again like you wouldn't jump right into sort of hip opening poses perhaps you you wouldn't talk a lot about body parts at first um i think that sort of parallels for eating disorder patients getting more comfortable with their bodies um Mm -hmm. and sort of reconnecting with sort of what their bodies can do rather than how their bodies look and that kind of thing um i Mm -hmm. really like the idea i hope that the research will continue to support that right that sounds great. Yeah. And it's interesting, as you were just talking about that, um, Maria sent in a question, which I think is a nice corollary, which is what about non-body related grounding techniques if the body is a big source of avoidance related feelings? Um, so if, you know, if there's anything you want to say about that in terms of, it sounds great to modify some of the yoga interventions, being mindful of how the body can be you know, a complicated um, source of, you know, feelings for people who have had trauma or eating disorders. How about non-body related grounding techniques? Like what would be one that you might use with a patient or that you think is helpful? Um, Perhaps breathing without, you know, really talking about stomach and diaphragm and things. Um, Mm -hmm. Maybe sort of noticing things in the room. It's a little trickier. I'm so yep. used to, um, right? You, you like really want to go right to like, you know, how you feel, but, um, yeah, yeah perhaps, yeah, sort of more breathing techniques, uh, might be a way to go. And also there, we don't really, in a, along the lines of yoga, we don't really know if it's the physical postures or the breathing or the relaxation or exactly, um, what might drive oh. it. Um, there's certainly probably benefits to all components. Right, right. Um, yeah, I think some of those, like you said, noticing things in the room so you could, you know, even just direct them away from their bodies and mm-hmm. um, describing things on the desk or describing um, colors or, you know, shapes that they see or things like that. Um, right. Do you hear the air conditioner? Do you hear the traffic outside? Yeah, exactly. And then I know, um, let's see. I know that you also have an interest in obesity, um, and maybe if you could just, you know, obviously sometimes obesity and eating disorder behaviors co-occur, sometimes they don't. Um, where within the the sort of integrated treatment or connecting it, you know, with the PTSD, like, would the focus be on, you know, dealing with the obesity? And weight loss, and how does that kind of um, how does that hang with the other um, ideas that you have about this integrated or concurrent treatment? Right, that certainly adds more complexity. Um, people with PTSD <laughs> tend right, to have higher there. rates of obesity as well. Um, 
which yeah. also which might also be part of why like the another mechanism for disordered eating if they engage in disordered eating to try to manage or lose weight um, and, and of course we know that our as we as we try to help our patients normalize their eating they might be fearful of gaining weight and that's um, certainly something to work on um, yeah I think I mean I know there's you know some work that's trying to be done on sort of comorbid eating and PTSD and trying to integrate that with um, PTSD treat sorry it, in, so I know there's some work being done on integrating obesity and eating treatment um, and then as far as integrating that more with PTSD treatment, um, I mean, if, for me, I would probably first really focus on the normalizing eating and providing psychoeducation about that. And for patients who are overweight mm -hmm. and binge eating, you know, they might naturally lose weight. Um, talking a lot about the functional length, because I, there are some patients, you know, who, who might want to be heavier, um, but might be starting to have medical problems because of it. Um, mm -hmm. And talking with colleagues who have done trials for um, for PTSD without really focusing on eating, they they have a lot of anecdotal studies of their patients' PTSD gets better, and all of a sudden they like lose a bunch of weight, and because oh. that the overweight's no longer serving that function, um, which mm. is really cool to hear. Um, yeah. I mean, and I mean lose weight in a healthy way, not a not an unhealthy okay. way. Right. Yeah. I think that is what's so, so fascinating about all different layers is just how how the different interventions and different targets, you know, can result in multiple um, areas improving or, you know, changing because of improvement in one area or not. Um, right. But that whole interplay is really um, important as a clinician, you know, to be aware of the different areas. And I think that was nicely illustrated with your um, – you know, with your portion of your slides about just assessing from various vantage points. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I, I love that about the case formulation, um, really doing that yes. with your patient and figuring out how everything works together. Absolutely. And I think clinically, I'm sure you've had this experience, patients really um, appreciate the, the case conceptualization being, you know, collaborative and transparent and being able to see it mapped out for themselves oftentimes is sort of eye-opening. It's not that they haven't thought about these things before, but in that kind of um, connected way, I think people really respond well to thinking mm -hmm. about all the sources of input. Um, yeah. And I think we're going to probably be wrapping up. I, if anybody has any last, this would be our time for one more question. If anyone has one they want to send along, um, we'll just wait a moment and then as we're waiting, I'm just going to also say a reminder that our next webinar is scheduled for October 10th, and that's with Dr. James Mitchell, and he'll be discussing the topic of integrating psychotherapy and medication in the treatment of eating disorders. You can find out more about this and other upcoming webinars by visiting the adweb.org um, website and clicking on the Education tab. Um, so I think that wraps it up for us, everyone. And Thank you again, Dr. Mitchell, for a fantastic presentation. Um, I think it was super helpful and very informative for everybody to hear your thoughts on this. So thank you. Sure, and thank you so much for moderating, and thank you, everyone, for listening, and AED for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you for everyone for participating, um, and enjoy the rest of your day or evening. All right, take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.